So, um, briefly, this uh, initiative, uh, you've heard about it, hopefully you will, uh, you know, by, by the end of the, this workshop, you will all know very well about it. This is a, a capacity building program uh, implemented by the Global Food Regulatory Science Society in collaboration with uh, Laval University, the uh, Food Risk Analysis and Regulatory Excellence Platform, and funded by the US uh, Codex Office uh, in the US Department of Agriculture. The main objective of this initiative is to enhance codex capacities in the Arab region. That's really the objective. Any number of ways, uh, enhancing effective participation, effective participation in number, in quality, uh, enhancing also the impacts of codex standards or contribution to uh, codex uh, standards development on the food control systems at the national level as well as the regional level. I believe I have had the opportunity to uh, present this uh, at the last uh, um, at, at the at the last uh, session of uh, uh, you know the, the eight well trying to remember now it was on the 18th so essentially the the main uh, uh, Dubai International Food Safety Conference Day the uh, uh, in presence meeting now as part of this initiative uh, we had the privilege to organize a meeting gathering codex contact points from the various countries of the region uh, who met uh, in September, uh, in the middle of, of September, here in Dubai. And we were also joined by a number of other codex delegations uh, from the region online. And this is the slide that we used, in fact, or that was generated as a result of the, of the meeting meaning the areas of agreement or consensus on further investments, future investments. Uh, there was a call on the part of the participants in this event that we needed to focus not only on the participation in codex meetings, but primarily to invest in the foundations of the food control systems that contribute to a better preparation and a better participation in international standard setting activities. So, and we'll see, they made actually some specific recommendations. Uh, I remember, I mean, we, we talked about the Food Risk Analysis Center or Food Risk Assessment Center in, in the region. We talked about the data generation. And in fact, the work that uh, Dr. Asouf has presented is practically a response to one of the priorities that was expressed which is essentially around availability of the data. There was a point that was made around communication between codex delegations in the Arab region. And uh, acknowledging that there is a coordination, of course, that is being carried out uh, by the coordinator for the Near East region, uh, but also acknowledging that the Near East region does not encompass all Arab countries. So for example, Morocco is not in the Near East region as far as the distribution or the uh, geographic distribution under the FAO, WHO, or under the Codex uh, Coordinating Committees. So in order to be more encompassing, there was the idea of focusing this initiative on all Arab countries in order to include Morocco, Mauritania, Somalia, Djibouti, uh, Palestine, so essentially all the various member states of the League of Arab States. So that's also one of the, uh, I would say, consequences of the recommendations that we uh, that we had as a result of that uh, of that gathering. The question of communication between these delegations came about, and basically uh, everybody expressed that continuing to communicate through email chains is not the most effective. Perhaps the next, the next level was to create WhatsApp groups. Yes, WhatsApp groups are great, but I don't know if you are like me right now, I'm almost spending as much time trying to answer my WhatsApp messages as much as I'm spending time on answering my emails. It's becoming basically a second mailbox, you know? Uh, so those tools are okay, but they're not sustainable. And uh, the idea is potentially to use a technology-driven platform, so an information and communication technology-based tool, 
And a lot of the members actually present at that meeting praised the tool that is used by the GSO in the context of preparing uh, standards, golf standards. In fact, also, we, we've learned subsequently that Exmo has also another platform that could be also explored in that regard. But in any case, an ICT that seems to be performing well and well endorsed by the members could be potentially put at the disposal of, uh, of the members in order to use it more effectively. So we uh, are going to be benefiting from the generosity of the GSO in uh, making us uh, learn more about this, uh, this tool and explore opportunities of adopting it for the communication uh, between the members. The same thing applies uh, with the Edsmo tool. And then after that, it's going to be up to the membership and also the feasibility, I guess. It's going to be mostly around the feasibility of how we can actually implement a uh, platform of communication as quickly as possibly be. The idea, again, what are we intending for? Uh, we're intending for a web-enabled tool uh, with uh, a username and a password protected access, uh, where there is essentially a protective environment for people to exchange information, to comment on, on documents. There might be even a public area, uh, again, that is web-enabled, where the outputs of the work could be made available to uh, all the community. But essentially that you would not have to wait or to look in your uh, in your uh, emails or in WhatsApp messages whether you received something that you need to address. All your tasks would be identified. All the next steps could be uh, could be also uh, identified there, and we can also organize uh, collective work as a result of, of this. So collective work could be organized as part of these tools. So this is something that we took as a recommendation and we will be looking at implementing it in the upcoming few weeks, hopefully. Uh, Max actually will have to take a few months, but uh, we will have to report very soon on, on the, our ability to, uh, uh, to develop and to use such a tool. Some effort also was dedicated during the uh, September meeting uh, towards the identification of priority committees where um, the Arab countries considered that we needed to have a stronger investment, stronger investment meaning stronger presence, better preparation, better participation. And uh, there was the identification of two categories of committees. For the subject matter committees or the horizontal committees, it was identified that the Codex Committee on Food Additives would be one of the priorities. CCPR, pesticide residues, residues on veterinary drugs in food, the contaminants committee, and possibly the codex committee on food import and export cert uh, certification systems, inspection and certification systems. So essentially those were identified as the priorities for the region. For the vertical committees, it was identified that the fats and oils, committee, the fish and fishery products, the spices and culinary herbs would be the areas of interest for the region. So of course, what this will mean is that we will focus the initial investment of resources primarily to these committees first. It doesn't mean that we will stop there because we think that priorities will evolve and hopefully will cover the majority, if not all the committees at the end of this initiative or when we reach hopefully a sustainable uh, you know, effort in, in this initiative. A number of discussions during the September meeting also focused on the national codex capacities. One of the reasons countries do not have the same level of, uh, of participation or preparation is that the national codex capacities are not necessarily ready, or there is a limited awareness of the importance of codex proceedings. And there will be an investment going to uh, national codex capacities. So essentially also developing training, awareness, uh, raising activities, resources, again, building a lot on what FAO and WHO have developed. We're not starting from scratch here. What we will be doing hopefully is complementing the efforts and the investments that are made by the international organizations in this regard. And finally, and I'm going to come back to this, it was very important to ensure the sustainability of this effort. And the only way we sustain this effort is if 
the work around codex is in fact embedded and anchored in organizations that have the mandates uh, around standardization and in fact we have two of those that are active in this area and have observer status within the codex alimentarius commission uh, the gcc standardization organization as well and as the arab industrial development standardization there's an s making it missing in my slide standardization and mining organization and in fact Earlier, I think in the uh, chat, I saw uh, a note saying, uh, when will we see an Arab standardization organization? I would say we have one. In fact, we have more than one. We have one at the sub-regional level, that is the GCC, uh, the GSO, and one at the Arab level, that is ETSMO. So essentially, we do have that. Essentially, now it's making sure that we leverage uh, their contribution and hopefully we collaborate in a manner to further enhance uh, the impacts of the work that these organizations are conducting. Now, this is essentially what we're going to be aiming for in the upcoming period. We started discussions uh, with uh, those two organizations, and hopefully these uh, discussions will lead to the development of uh, an understanding about the way our collaboration will be structured. I think we all share the same goal, which is the sustainability of this action and also leveraging the capacity of these organizations to bring together their membership and essentially to pool the resources and the competencies under their jurisdiction in order to drive uh, a better participation and an effective contribution of countries of the region in codex proceedings. We're gonna be also looking at a collaboration with national codex structures. And I'm happy to report that an initial engagement happened with the Egyptian Standardization Organization, uh, which is the host of the Codex Contact Point in uh, the Arab Republic of Egypt. And we will be working also on strengthening the uh, Egyptian Codex capacity. Uh, we're not starting actually there from, I would say, uh, a low level. On the contrary, we will be building, in fact, on an existing uh, strong uh, structure. But the idea is that through the collaboration with uh, the Egyptian Codex Contact Point, we will be able to develop resources that could be potentially useful to other parts of the Arab region. So essentially, the idea is that we will leverage that capacity to uh, hopefully further support the rest of the region. And this is really to support national codex structure. So the work at the national level will have to complement the work that we will are doing at the uh, regional level. Now, so you saw already uh, these slides before. In fact, we're going to be focusing again on enhanced participation. And uh, again, uh, when we mean when we mean what we mean by enhanced participation and presence, really that the presence of codex delegations at these meetings gets actually better prepared, a better understanding of the agenda items, a better analysis of the agenda items, the development of positions in a substantiated manner and hopefully also contribution to the agenda. Uh, so essentially with positions that are expressed and again, using really uh, the priorities that were expressed. We actually piloted this in the previous codex season and we are starting now a new codex season. So in fact, uh, post CAC 44, uh, the new codex sta season started. Uh, in fact, right now, as we speak, the uh, codex committee on uh, food for special dietary uses, nutrition and food, uh, food for special dietary uses is running at the same time. Now it wasn't identified as a priority for now for the, for the region, but that can come in the future. So we will be focusing on the future codex season and we will be preparing, hopefully having the mechanisms in place to prepare for participation of countries at the upcoming, uh, uh, at these upcoming meetings. And again, really the focus on data uh, and preparation, so the foundation. So uh, Amin presented one of the key areas. You've heard about uh, the effort that we started on the occurrence data collection. And hopefully that's going to be really the first investment on a broader exercise that we will uh, maintain. And again, reiterating the invitation to those who have data, academic centers, uh, research institutions, regulatory authorities, industry that might be having the data on those to really get in touch with us and actually 
support us in accessing the data. Of course, we will apply acceptability criteria and, and we will apply the same lens that was presented earlier to make sure that the data that is um, embedded in, in this initiative will have the level of reliability needed to be used for, for example, the development of exposure assessments. We spoke about consumption data. That's, uh, this is an area where I think it will be a multi-year exercise. We started with the methodological aspect, but we will be hopefully also moving from methodological to implementation in collaboration with some countries who um, are either in the process of starting their initiative or potentially of also countries that can support others because of the experience that they have gathered or garnered through their own implementation. And there was finally another, another element. Uh, this also resulted from the discussions as a result of the previous uh, codex season. In the context of preparing for the last uh, codex committee on residues for veterinary drugs and food, there was a clear statement made by a number of codex delegations from the region that codex MRLs for vet drug residues do not cover tissues of interest to the region. In the region, we consume uh, camel milk, we consume uh, camel meat, all sorts of tissues, you know, coming from this particular species. And in fact, um, those who submit data to regulatory agencies or to codex, uh, to JECFA, do not submit data for these species in particular. So how do we address this gap? And is there a way to use codex guidance in this regard? In fact, we have an opportunity in that CCRBDF developed and adopted at the last session a guidance document for extrapolation of MRLs. So this guideline has the potential to be applied, and essentially we're going to look at the feasibility of application of this guideline and the development of a methodology that would be applied to extrapolate MRLs in order to support the availability of MRLs for tissues of interest to the region, and particularly to camelite. It can be to camelite, but it can be also to, for example, other aquaculture fish that is more of interest to the region. The region, for example, doesn't do salmon. Uh, for all I know, I don't think that there is aquaculture of salmon uh, in, in the region. I don't think the climate allows that. So there are other species that are being uh, you know, used for this, and there might be an opportunity as well, if there is no code XMRL for those, to look at how we can use this guideline, uh, this guidance document to apply it uh, for the purposes of the region. And again, I think uh, you know, now you're going to get familiar with, the, uh, with this slide. There's no way we can achieve this unless we have competencies, we have data, and we have the tools that support that. And you see, you know, that balance, we need sustainability. That's what the, the time, you know, the time clock is for. We cannot do this, you know, through a little workshop uh, where we think, you know, we have developed competencies. This has to be an undertaking on a, on a long term. And that's why sustainability and collaboration with the structures in the region, such as GSO and ESMO, hopefully will help us achieve that sustainability. And the other element, funding. Uh, we are very lucky right now to have the funding from a capacity building program such as the Arab Codex Initiative, but um, we need to make sure that we leverage various other sources that are available and we have as much collaboration as possible to sustain this effort. Um, you know, the idea is that the region, of course, can take benefit from these capacity building program and funding initiatives, but we need also to use some self-resourcing. And this is what we will need to try to bolster in the region as well. And there might be other uh, ideas that you will explore with you uh, during the rest of this uh, symposium on how we can sustain this particular effort. So you see, I mean, I'm not gonna go through this again. This is our vision really for the future. Uh, we would like to have uh, uh, investments in each of these four key pillars on an ongoing basis, uh, particularly around codex and having really an ongoing structure that supports um, a good knowledge of codex processes and, and procedures, but also the development of procedures and protocols for coordination within the region, whether be it at the national level, 
for the preparation of positions, but also at the regional level as well. We need also to make sure that there is that spillover effect of um, this international food safety standards uh, on the food control systems in the region. Competencies, competencies, competencies. I mean, I don't think that we will insist enough on, on this. It, that's what's going to make this possible. Uh, investing in coordination efforts and also uh, creating really that data hub uh, that we would like to sustain, starting with these databases and investing in uh, both uh, the data collection and the data generation, because data already exists and we need to collect it. And also, we need to identify areas where we need to invest further on data. Last but not least, I would like to mention uh, another, uh, another investment that we will be talking about later on during the symposium. In fact, tomorrow, um, a lot of the data is coming from laboratory activities. Structuring a food laboratory community in the region is one of the goals that we will be pursuing. One of the organizations that works internationally at supporting this effort of um, sustaining the food laboratory science around the world and actually also supporting harmonization in food laboratory methods, standardization of food laboratory methods is AOAC International. And our region is one of the regions that does not have a representation of AOAC. Uh, we counted only 20 members of, of AOAC International out of 3,000 from around the world, 20 members in the region. Our intent is to move there that, you know, to multiply that. And in fact, uh, we will be uh, investing in enrolling new 50 members into the region. And then hopefully we are also going to be aiming to create an Arab section of AOAC International that encompasses all countries of the Arab League of the League of Arab States. Uh, and hopefully that's going to be another building blocks in fostering food laboratory science in the region. So that's what we hope that through this initiative we will aim to create is really uh, create a momentum around uh, this effort in the region. And hopefully we're going to be joined by others, uh, by collaborators from the public and the private sector. Uh, also aiming to coordinate uh, uh, as much as possible with international organizations and their efforts in, uh, in the region. And hopefully we will work all together to promote food regulatory science in the region for the benefit of the region's consumers, the region's uh, industry as well, uh, so that we provide the enabling environment uh, for uh, the best development of food and agri-food business in the region. So um, this is what I wanted to share with you. Again, um, it's another opportunity to reiterate the importance of investment in this area. And I welcome also your input and your ideas as to the areas of priority that you think we may have missed, in fact, as a result of, uh, of this endeavor. Thank you very much.